Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crowns, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yogia and I urge Sensha to be the same mind of the Lord. Yes, I and I ask you also, my little companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any absence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Howdy. Forza. start this morning by saying that I hope that you guys will turn my microphone on for me. <laughs> that I hope that you guys will um, keep me in your thoughts and prayers this week as you go about it. Um, Last week, let's just say as the assistant principal, you don't look forward to days when the principal is not there. <laughs> because I have enough of a job to do just being the assistant principal. And when the principal's not there, if I step up to do her job, then who does my job? That would be me as well. And so it's a little tough. And so last week when my principal told me she was going to be going to workshops on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, I certainly was not looking forward to last week. Uh, but she was gone on Monday and Tuesday, and then on Wednesday she showed up wearing the mask. So I knew something was up. And when, she, when I walked into her office, she started speaking to me. I knew something was up because she could hardly speak. And by about noon, she said, Mr. Ford's an eye. And I said, go home. And so she went home. And by 2 o'clock that afternoon, I had a text that said, I was just diagnosed with COVID. So I was by myself all week last week and facing another week of not knowing whether I'll be by myself all week this week. So if you will, please keep me in your thoughts and prayers as you go out this week with your jobs and the things that you do. If you have your Bibles, pull them out because we're going to do, we're going to look at a lot of things today. Um, You know, typically us preachers, we'll find a few verses and we concentrate there and we'll talk 30 minutes on them, five verses. So it's a little daunting to me this morning as I tell you that our scriptures will be taken from three chapters. And I'm going, how am I going to get through this? Well, because the only thing, only thing I can say is I just got to move, right? So we're going to look at, start with Matthew chapter 5. And if you look in your Bible, as I'm sure it is, because it is in mine, you'll notice something different. Because starting in Matthew chapter 5, the color of the letters change, don't they? All of a sudden they're red. And it keeps being red. <laughs> well, 
for a while, all the way to chapter 7. And so, what do we call this section of Scripture? Well, that first section of Scripture is called the Bad Beatitudes. What's the whole two chapters called? The Sermon on the, on the Mount, right? So now let's face it. This is Matthew chapter 5, right? So we've had to go through 33 years of Jesus' life in the first little while. So this is a pretty early sermon in Jesus' ministry, right? As a matter of fact, it's probably the first major sermon in front of a large group of people that he's done. So you might even say, well, okay, it's kind of his debut or whatever. Well, think about this, guys. If you were speaking to a group of people and, and, and a large group of people who never heard you speak before, I don't know about you, but coming from a public speaking background, I think I would probably try to focus in and hone in on something specific to try to teach so that I can at least get these people the message I'm trying to go for. Yeah, Jesus did... Yeah, no. Huh. For the next little bit, I want us to look at the variety of subjects that Jesus covers in two chapters in this open sermon. Okay? So let's start... He's already started, of course, right? What's the first thing we see? The, the Beatitudes, right? And we think of this as a really positive thing. But understand, y'all, are the Beatitudes really positive? If you look at them, and what I'm saying is, if you look at them from a human point of view, he says, blessed are who? Poor. Is that positive? <laughs> to be poor? Is that positive? No. Blessed are poor. Blessed are those that mourn. mourn. Okay? Blessed are those that are meek. Now, meek at least does have a little bit of a positive sway to it. But I want you to think about meek people. Seriously. In your entirety of life that you've lived, think about one or two people you've known that were the type of person you would deem meek. Now, we always look up to those people, right? Because they're able to control themselves, they're able to keep things under control. But I want to ask you something. With most of the world not being meek, what typically happens to the meek people? They get stepped on. They get walked over. They get trampled on. And we're so them <coughs> because they didn't say much about it. Right? The poor. Those that mourn. Those who are meek. Number six. Those who are hungry. Right? Now, we're going to stop right there because, again, I'm not preaching just on the Beatitudes. We've got way a lot more to cover. But what I'm trying to get you to see is... My ultimate goal in this, and my ultimate point in this, I think we'll see when we get to the end, is this. I hate to tell you, but our human nature is about as far from Christianity as you can get. And that's important that we understand that. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think for a long time we've understood that. And I'm talking about decades, if not centuries, right? I don't know about you, but I'm 52 years old. And I can tell you right now that as I grew up in the Imboden Church of Christ, the people that surrounded me, I certainly didn't view as flawed, messed up people. As a matter of fact, the personas that was put forth was that they had it all together, wasn't it? Isn't that your experience as you grew up? The people that went to church, oh, they've got it all together. Well, let me wake you up if you don't realize. 
The only difference between the people in here and the people out there is that we know God's going to give us mercy. Right? That's it. We make the same mistakes everybody else does. But look at the variety of subjects. He got it goes from the blessing now over here. And he talks about this idea of the salt of the earth. And the light of the world. That's a whole other new subject, right? And over here he's saying, we've got to go out in the world and take it. But again, I want to emphasize to you, though, he's not saying, go out there and show them exactly. Because you can. He's saying, take me out to the world. That's one of the cool things I like about... I know we're always struggling every time I come to our Okay, well, who's going to do the candles, right? But think about the symbolism, right, of that idea. Right? Because in the beginning of service, we're bringing Jesus' light in, we're sharing with the room. But then at the end of service, which to me is really important, right? You, you, you come up and the, the candles get, get extinguished, but the light doesn't, right? Because the light gets carried where? Out the door. Out the door, in, into the world, right? And so... He tells us here, and, and we've talked. I, I know I've told my green bean story here before, so I'm not going to tell you. Okay? I'm not going to bore y'all with the green bean. No, don't get me wrong. It's a good story. I, it's a good story, right? But but the bottom line is, salt never says, "Look at me." Ever, ever. Like like at the end of that story, you know, I'm never. Said, boy, that's some good salt right there. No, you don't. It's whatever you put that salt on that you say is good, right? And so the idea being that it's our job to go out into the world and not shine our light to the world, but shine Christ's light to the world. To show them what Christ wants for them. But then he goes past that and he starts talking about the idea of course they were, they were hung up on the old law, right? They were hung up on the old law. So, so here we see some more scriptures we're so used to talking about. I, I don't think I ever put together how many scriptures that we're used to that come out of this sermon. But, you know, in verse 18 he talks about, you know, one jot or one tittle will not pass away from the law until it's fulfilled. You know, And so this idea of of the old law is not going to go away until the new law is, is, is established and everything's good, but it, but it has been. I'm here now, so that old law is going away. Right? And then he gets into some more of our messed up ideas, right? Verses 21 and 22. You know, you've heard them said by the old, the old time that it's, it's not good to kill. But then he goes on further and says, if you say to your brother, you fool. You're guilty of murder. Hey, y'all. I've never admitted this in my entire life. I'm a serial killer. <laughs> right? Because I can't count the number of times I pull up to a stop sign, somebody does something, somebody gets behind me, somebody pulls up in front, somebody does something crazy, and I'm going, you stupid now, I have to say you, right? But if you say to your brother, Raka, right? Whoever shall say thou, what? Fool shall be in danger of hell. Y'all, it's not in us to do what's right. Oh, brother, I just don't understand. Really? Really? Well, let me ask you this. What did Paul say about it? Because he was pretty clear. Paul said, the things that I want to do, those are the things I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, well, those are the things that I do. Am I right or am I wrong? Right? That's what he said. So this whole idea of he's preaching, but look at all the subjects that he goes through here, right? Um, then he goes into this idea of 
Lord knows none of us hold grudges, do we? Nobody's ever had a grudge, right? But in verse 23 and verse 24, he deals with a real citizen subject, right? If, if you've got something against the brother, but you go to church, and then you realize you've got something against the brother. Now, now I want you to understand here, y'all. Jesus said if that happens, it's your job to go talk to your brother. Now, wait a second. I'm the one that's been wrong here. I'm the one that they did it to. Why is it my job to go to them? Well, to be honest with you, love. Right? Love, 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 love. The gospel in the word is love. Love thy neighbor as thy brother. Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And everything else is hung up on those two things. And you'll do those two things. So the idea being, we care more about our brother than we do our sons. You remember the meat committed to the right? The document there, right? Here a while back, Mr. Weeks, this, you know, we, I don't know how much y'all know about the martial arts side of, of Mr. Weeks or whatever, I don't know, but, um, but we had, uh, uh, we've been having for some years now a thing called tribal council because of Mr. Weeks' martial arts, martial arts background as well as the Native American background. So every year we have a family gathering where we bring everybody together and it kind of centers around uh, not only the martial arts, but Native American lifestyle. And so Mr. Weeks came up here all back with this idea of let's, let's choose Native American names. Well, y'all, I don't know about you. But I ain't got a drop of Indian blood in me. <laughs> what in the world am I going to, what, I mean, come on, man. How am I going to come up with a name? And I've got to come up with a name with meaning. I mean, gee, you know, what am I going to do? Well, you know, the more I thought about it, do you know what my Native American name is? Kia Gano Histi, which means the way. Number one is obviously it's a nod to Christ, right? The way. Number two, the idea being in ATF, in the martial arts, I'm an eighth degree black belt now. So since I'm the third highest rank in the system, obviously if you want to come up through the ranks, you've got to come through me. So, I'm the way, the nod to Christ. But I also chose it based on just historically my life. Because believe it or not, no matter as much as I love to stand up in front of people and talk and be outward and everything else, the truth is, y'all, I got a little bit of that neat side of me where I let people walk all over me sometimes. So part of that choice of that name is this. The way could also be translated what? The path or the road. What happens to the road? Think about it. Vehicles travel up and down that road constantly. They're going, they're moving, and that road is responsible for those people getting carried from one place to another. They couldn't get there without them. But what happens to the road? It, it wears out. It gets potholes. It gets grooves. It gets divots. And it's constantly in the
Y'all, Christ wants us to understand. He wants us to realize that the ultimate goal of Christianity is to give yourself away to everybody else. And y'all, I hate to say it, but that is certainly against every fiber of our being. Because every fiber of our being screams, you take care of yourself first. He goes on with this idea. You know, you down in verse 27. You've heard that it was said of them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 28. But I say to you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Y'all, we even need to talk about that. <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, serious. That's the standard? Because I can't count the number of times in my life, I don't know about you, but the old saying, well, you know, well, you know, can't touch, it doesn't hurt to look. Yeah, it does. Right? Right? So, it, but it's not according to us. Y'all, our view is messed up. That's all. I mean, that's when we get down to it. That's the fact. The God standard is so high. You and I don't get it. Sometimes I don't think. How high God's standard is. Let me explain to you how high God's standard is. And I may be, I, I, in case y'all can't tell, just lay me down and come over here. That's a sign saying, uh oh, he's going off track again. What it to us as humanity is the ultimate betrayal? The highest betrayal. Is it not adultery? When one spouse cheats upon another spouse? I mean, I can't think of anything that I would see as more um, heinous than one spouse cheating on the other, right? So let's deal with that. Bible tells us that God said someone, you tell me who, gave us a writing of divorcement. Who was that? Who does the verse the Bible tell us gave us a writing of divorcement? Inspired by God, right? 2 Timothy 3.16 For all scriptures given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine for for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, the man of thoroughly God, the man of God may be thoroughly versed in all the works. He says, Moses gave you a writing of divorce. That's my first point here. <laughs> Who gave it to us? Moses. Let me tell you, that's God going to look. I didn't start this man. Uh uh. Moses gave that to you. But I want you to notice what he said second. He said, Moses gave it to you for a reason. Do you remember what that reason is? Moses gave it to you because of the hardness of your hearts. Wait a second. I've been cheated on. But I've got the hard heart. Yes, you do. Because you read that whole section of scripture and what God comes around and says is this. My way is this. Get over it. Forgive your partner. It's one man, one woman, for life. End of story. Done. Now, whenever I say that, I proceed by saying, we all understand that God Himself said, Moses gave it to you, and I okay, right? I'm not putting down anybody who ever got a divorce because of adultery. Please understand. What we are talking about is standards. And I'm trying to help us realize how high God's standards are. God's standards are there is no divorce. 
You picked him or her. They made a mistake. Move on. But since you can't do that, I allowed Moses to give you a writing of divorce so that you can move on. Okay? So I want to be very clear on that because I know sometimes people get caught up in that book. You're, so you're saying it's not okay? No. What I'm trying to get to is what God's saying about us. And what God's saying about us is that Christianity and the desire to be a Christian and to do things the Christian way is not in us. He goes on. Verse 37. Well, here's a big Here's a big one. Verse 37. He says, But let your nay, yay be yay, and your nay be nay. Right? How many times have we talked? How many times have you in your life said, Let your yay be yay, and your nay be nay? Right? I know I have many, 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 many times. But what's he saying here? The idea. What's the point? Let me tell you the point. He's saying, Don't promise. Don't take an oath. Why? Well, let me explain to you why, in case you don't. Or you've never thought about it. The only need that I have to say I promise is if I've broken a promise before. You understand what I'm saying? If I say to Miss Susan, I'm coming over to your house tomorrow at 6 o'clock, I would never utter the words, I promise. I would just tell her I'm coming and I go, right? The only reason I say I promise is if I failed before. <laughs> Am I right? The only reason I say, no, I promise I'm coming over to watch this block is because I didn't do it when I told her I was going to do it before. Because if I had done it, there would be no need for me to say I promise. It's not within us to do things the right way. So God constantly puts forth in front of us a standard, hoping we'll do the best we can, hoping that we'll strive for that, but knowing we can't. And the ultimate truth of that and proof of that is the fact that He, he knew it wouldn't happen. That's why He sent Jesus to die. Because if he thought we could do it, there's no need. He'd just say, you can do it. It's okay. And whoever does it goes to hell. Whoever does it goes to heaven. There you go. We're done. But he knew we couldn't do it. Therefore, he had to send the Savior. Down in verse 44. Oh, man. Here, he's cutting deep now. But I say, you love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. <laughs> now look. I mean, come on. I mean, you can expect me to love somebody who's good to me. You can expect me to love somebody who at least does me no harm, but you're sitting here telling me i got to love people who I don't even like. Yeah. You do because they're two separate things. I can want the best for you eternally, spiritually, and lovingly. At the same time, I don't like you as a person. But you know the key to that? I still got to put you first. I still got to accept that. Jesus gave us that ultimate example, didn't he? He's on the cross. They just feared him in the side. You understand what I'm saying? It's not enough you're hanging on a cross. It's not enough you got nails through your wrists and your ankle. It's not enough. That you ask for water and we put vinegar in your mouth. 
now. It's not enough. So we decided to stab you with a spear on top of it. And the last words you say to us is what? Forgive them. For they know not what they do. Wow. And then 6, he really, chapter 6, he, he starts off with a bang. He really starts thinking that. He says, don't do things before men. Why? For pride. Right? Take heed that you do not do your alms before men to be seen of them. <coughs> Otherwise you have no reward. But yet we do that all the time, don't we? But when thou do the Psalms, verse 3, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand does. Verse 7, but when you pray, don't you feign repetitions of the heathen does. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Right? And then, in the middle of it all, <laughs> he understands that we don't have it in us, and that's why he says, Here, let me tell you how to pray while I'm at it. And he gives us the example of how to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, I will be here. He lays it all out there for us to teach us because we don't have it in us. We don't know. We don't understand. We don't get it. And then verse 14, he comes right back and hits us again. For if you forgive men for their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then he turns around, actually, verse 16, and talks about hypocrite. Actually, causes. I mean, come on, man. He knows and understands that we don't. Boy, preaching, you're preaching such a positive image. No, you don't get it yet. Maybe. So let's talk a little bit. I'm not trying to put us down now. I'm dealing with reality. Because when we finally realize this is where we're at, we stop judging everybody else. We stop trying to fix everybody else. Wait a second, isn't that my job? Yes. To fix them. God's way. You see, for years, 20 something years as a preacher, I thought my way was to stand up for everybody and tell them, you stink, you, you're, you're terrible. <laughs> now I realize I had the job right. It's just the finger was going in the wrong direction. Right? Think about it. Go to the parable of the tares. You'll hear me harp about the parable of the tares forever. As long as you hear me preach, you're going to hear me talk about the parable of the tares. Because for 22 years I preached, and I thought my job was to tear out the tears. Right? That's my job. I'm the preacher. I'm supposed to go in, find the wheat, find the tears, take the tears and get rid of them. That's my job. That's what preachers do. That's what I was told my whole life. Until a few years ago when I went to a vacation Bible school and the preacher was standing up front talking about the parable of the tares. And he said, So they came in and they asked the owner of the land, Did you not sow good seed? And he said, Yeah, I sowed good seed. Well, then the enemies come in and he sowed tares out there. Do we need to go out and take the tares out? 
And what did the owner say? By the way, who is a representative of God in this story, right? What did the owner say to the people? Leave it to Miss Susan to say it the most positive way in the world. Let them grow. You know what I hear when I heard that? That's not your job. God said, that's not your job. When the harvest has come to fruition and it's all over with, it's all over with when it's time for the harvest, I will send in the harvesters. And they, by the way, which ain't me, they will go in and harvest everything together and they'll take the good stuff and put it over here and they'll take the bad stuff and they'll put it over there and we're all good. That's not your job. And after 22 years of preaching, when I finally heard that, Just like right now. I got upset. Because I realized I thought for 22 years I was doing what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to have been tending to the crowd. I was supposed to have been helping it grow. I was supposed to have been working and nourishing it. I was supposed to have been watering it. I was supposed to have been fertilizing it. I was supposed to have been trying to get everything to grow. Not tear it up. But I think most of us who are Christians go about in our lives believing we got a different job than what we got. Because we'd rather talk about the differences in my church and your church. We'd rather talk about whether or not it's okay to have a piano. We'd rather talk about whether or not it's okay for women to be in, in, in leadership a role. We'd rather talk about anything else under the sun except for Romans 1.16, which says, For the gospel is God's power and salvation. To everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. So he tells us. To love and care about. And in verse 19, he comes in and he starts telling us. <laughs> and y'all tell me it's a mighty amount of stuff Jesus crammed into this one sermon. It's amazing. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon this sermon. Y'all, I don't know about you, but I'm 52 years old. I've been teaching school for 26 years. And I've had one number stuck in my brain for my whole life. And that number is 28. <laughs> in case you don't know, that's the magic number for teachers. Because when you hit 28, you get to retire. I've been living my whole life trying to retire. Man, y'all got 26 in this year. Yeah. Here lately, I've been meeting with those retirement folks, and I've been looking at it now. 28 and a half. Matter of fact, now I know why when people are retired at 38 and 40. Because the amount of money you don't get paid ain't enough. But my point is, what am I trying to say? We spend our lives trying to get to the point where we put enough treasure up that we don't have to worry about it. But God's answer is, don't live this way. 
Live every day as a blessing. Whatever you get to do, thank God that you get to do it. I've been so excited lately to see Mr. Weeks back two nights a week teaching because Rick has been down in his knee replacement. Because I'll be honest with you here, folks. I thought the man was indestructible. <laughs> I'm, I'm living my life as a 30 to 40 year old man. How is a 70 year old man, you know, out working me every night at karate class? This is nuts. Well, guess what? He's 85, 86 now. Guess what? He's still out working. And I still can't figure out how he does. We always look forward to quitting, to retiring, to stopping. The point is go out and do what God wants us to do. Every day. Verse 24 of chapter 6. No man can serve two masters, for either you love one and hate the other, or you'll cling to the other one and despise the other. You can't serve God and man and both. Then 25, he picks up this idea of God taking care of us, right? And then he gets into 27, and he really starts to dig ass again when he says, Don't judge. You know, I used to preach that verse too at the same, same time I was judging. Oh well. I guess I would just lock down there a little bit when, when he talks about the idea of uh, there in verse 3 of verse 3, 4, and 5 of chapter 7 when he starts talking about the guy with the big old beam sticking out of his eye trying to take the little, little bitty tiny piece of stuff out. Have you ever looked, you know, really pictured that, you know? I'm up here with tree tweezers trying to get a little piece of dust out of our eye while I've got a beam sticking out of mine, you know? You know, well, that's ridiculous. I know it's ridiculous, but that's what we do. You know why? Because we're human. And he ties it all up in verse 12 when he gives us the golden rule. Right? All the things that you would that men do to you, you do it to them also. And my main point here is again the idea. We tend to look at that in reverse. Do not tell others as you would have them do to you. Listen to what he says. Whatever you want others to do to you, you have to do it to them first. Again, it's kind of like that. For those of you who come together and find that, that you've got something against a brother, whose job is it to come to that brother? It's your job. You see, go back to the parable of the tares. See, I was seeing the tares during all this stuff. I was preaching with the tares in mind. I didn't realize he was talking about the wheat. Verses 13 through 15 he talks about how the way is, is narrow and straight and all the false, false prophets that are out there. And then verse 16 through 21 he talks about the idea of, of the trees growing whatever they're supposed to grow. How, how you can't get different fruit from a certain kind of tree. And he ends in verse 21 by saying the facts here are what they are, and the bottom line is not everybody that says to me Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Y'all, I haven't looked at the clock in the last few minutes. i got a feeling I'm running over the lake. Yep. <laughs> but he ties it all up in verse 28 and 29. When he says that they were amazed at his doctrine. 
because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They were blown away by the depth and the intensity of the knowledge that they were hearing. But yet here we are, y'all, how many years later? And how many of those things that we talked about today are still going on? All of them. I've heard so many times in my career, I don't understand why the Jews couldn't get it. Well, the Jews had 2,000 less years than what we've had, and we still ain't getting it, so why are you surprised? Right? When the truth is, the fact is, nobody gets it, and nobody's going to. That's why you've got to rely upon grace. That's why you have to rely upon faith. That's why you have to rely upon the sacrifice that Jesus made. Because you can't do it. And guess what that's called? Romans 1.16. That's called the gospel. The good news. Because no matter how bad we leave here feeling about how terrible we are, we're never so bad or so far that God can't reach us and save us from ourselves. Wow. Father, we're so thankful for you. For your love and for your care and most assuredly for your sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. We are so thankful all that you do and all that you are. But mostly we're thankful for your caring, your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. Help us, Father, just to be half of what you are. To be a fourth. To show a fourth of the love and the care that you do. Because if we can just accomplish that, if we can just accomplish that, then maybe we will have taken the light from inside these walls out into the world to show others that it's not about us, it's about you. And we pray this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.